Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. As you guys know at this point, these videos are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my courses at Del Mar College. Anyone else who finds them useful, please hit like and let me know. Also, if you're in my class, hit like if you find them useful. Um, know that these are intended to provide some, a very simplified, foundational um, understanding of some very complex topics in microbiology, all dedicated towards health science majors. And if your instructor goes into more detail or covers it differently, learn it the way they want you to learn it. Um, again, this is just a supplement to my class to provide you some um, basic understanding of some of the sim simple uh, fundamental concepts in microbiology. Bleep, bleep. I can't talk today. Anyway, um, so we've been talking about the immune system. We've talked about um, innate immunity and born immunity, which is, provides a, a rapid response, very localized response with no memory component. Your white blood cells attack something if it's foreign, and as they attack it, they release chemicals that attract other white blood cells, and we wipe it out. If that doesn't work, if that process is going on and the organism continues to exist, then as it encounters some of our um, lymphocytes called T helper cells, as a macrophage gobbles, up, gobbles it up, it can present an antigen to a T helper cell or the T helper cell can bump into that antigen naturally. And they'll rapidly divide and clone themselves and secrete chemicals that cause other white blood cells to come to the site. T helper cells can activate T killer cells and natural killer cells um, the T cells will go and kill the foreign invader, releasing chemicals called perforins, um, and uh, some will stick around as T memory cells. They can also activate B lymphocytes. Some of the B lymphocytes, as they clone themselves, will stick around as memory cells. Some become plasma cells, which will begin to secrete antibodies against that specific foreign antigen or the invader that has that antigen on its surface, like a bacterium or virus, a fungus, a protozoan of some sort. Um, so um, now uh, we've talked about the different class of, of classes of antibodies. We talked about the specific immune system or also called acquired or adaptive immunity and the development of what we call the cell mediated response where T killer cells get involved or the humoral mediated response um, or antibody immune, uh, mediated immune response where we secrete antibodies against it. And they're working sometimes at the same time. Always memory cells can be developed from the specific immune or adaptive immune system, and therefore it has a memory component. It is also a much slower response with a much longer lasting response, okay? Now, um, we talked about the classes of antibodies, IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG, and IgM. We've talked about that. And we also talked about the structure of antibodies, the two heavy chains and two light chains, and it is the variable region, and there are two variable regions that can bind the foreign antigen. Now, one of the things I wanna talk about today is um, in our textbook, it's chapter 18, which is really what we call the practical applications of our knowledge of the immune, immune system. Now that we know how it works, how do we apply this to our lives to enhance our immune system to help fight infections and other things, okay? So, one of the things I wanna talk about is um, we can use antibodies for what we call rapid testing. And there's a number of different types of rapid tests, okay? So essentially what can happen is this. All of these are gonna involve what we call monoclonal antibodies. So before I get into the rapid testing, one of the things I want to tell you is that almost all of these involve, all these rapid tests do what we call monoclonal antibodies. Well, mono means single, and clonal means they are identical. So what happens is this. I can stimulate an organism's immune system to make antibodies against a specific antigen. So let's say I have some, anti some antigen, um, some organism here that I know makes this protein on its surface called protein Q. Well, it's just, I'm making something up. If I expose this, organ this um, antigen covered uh, foreign cell to some organism, let's say I have a cute little rabbit 
and I inject this organism or just that particular protein into the rabbit. The rabbit's B cells will eventually start to secrete antibodies that are against that particular antigen or protein. And so this rabbit will start to have these antibodies floating in its bloodstream, these anti-Q antibodies. And of course, these B cells will replicate and make tons of these antibodies. We will trigger the animal's uh, humoral immune response, and they will make millions of these antibodies. Now, if I can isolate this little Q protein and put it on a glass bead, and let's say I put it in a big column and I have tons of these glass beads packed in this column that will drip fluid through it. And all of these little glass beads have these little Q proteins on the surface now. I can take a drop of this rabbit's blood or some of its blood, some of its serum, isolated from its blood, and I can run the, the fluids through here and those little antibodies will begin to stick to these little glass beads, this little glass or column full of glass beads. Okay, we call this liquid chromatography. And so I will get all the antibodies stuck through there as the liquid runs through. Then what I can do is use another chemical and flood it through here. And as that chemical comes dripping out, it actually washes off the antibodies. And because all of these antibodies are against that specific antigen, they're called monoclonal antibodies. So when we talk about these tests, we actually have to develop the monoclonal antibodies against that specific antigen. And that can be done pretty simply in a lab. We spent some time doing this against a novel protein that I searched for in some of my graduate research, um, where we injected little bunnies with something that didn't make them sick. And then you take a drop of blood, like you giving blood, and we ran it through some columns coated with glass beads. You can order the glass beads coated with a specific protein, and there's a company that does this. Um, and then you can isolate the antibodies by running them through this um, uh, column of glass beads. And then you run an elution fluid through here, which will break the bond between the antibody and the antigen. And then you can wash out at the antibodies and then isolate and purify them. So they're called monoclonal antibodies. And it's a very complex process and it's expensive, but you can develop monoclonal antibodies against a specific antigen. Now, the reason that's important is because once I have those antibodies, I can do lots of rapid testing with them. For example, um, we can take a particular uh, type of antibody called IgM. If you remember, the M stands for massive. The IgM antibodies, their constant region will link up with four others, making what we call a pentamer. And they would all bind to anything that has the Q protein on its surface. And because each antibody can bind to two um, cells with the foreign antigen, then all of these cells, up to 10 of them, can be bound up by one immunoglobulin M, IgM. And if I have a monoclonal antibody, an IgM, that can recognize a specific antigen, then I can get 10 of the cells with that antigen on its surface. And because each cell has more than one copy of these antigens, then I can have a whole nother pentamer bind up 10 more of these, or at least nine more of these cells. And then another set. And you can see how ad nauseum, we could go on forever till we get sick of this, I could bind up tons and tons of these foreign cells all that have the exact same surface antigen. And this clumping reaction is called agglutination. Or sometimes they call it flocculation. So now, if I have a kit that has a well here, like a little low spot, and I know that um, I have this monoclonal antibody in a little dropper. One good example is syphilis. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease that can attack the nervous system. 
and there's a kit called an RPR kit. And I forget what the RPR stands for. It's rapid something, reagent. But anyway, I can take someone's fluids, some blood from a patient, put it in a well, put some drops of this IgM from a specific, um, well, that's developed against an antigen that's on the surface of the, the organism that causes syphilis. And if I get a glutination reaction, because the only thing in there that would cause agglutination would be the IgM against an antigen on syphilis, the bug that causes it, then I know that patient has syphilis. So it's a very rapid way for us to test instead of doing all these biochemical tests that we did in the lab. So we can do rapid testing with monoclonal antibodies. So it's a really good application of our understanding of how our immune cells can develop antibodies against a specific antigen if we can isolate a single group of, of antibodies, all against the same antigen, then I can run an agglutination test and tell if I have that particular organism. Another type of test that can be done with monoclonal antibodies um, is called um, uh, a fluorescent assay. Assay simply means test. And fluorescent means it will fluoresce or glow a very bright color. So now, let's say I have, um, it doesn't exactly work like this, but this is a good example. Let's say I have a little plastic plate in a lab that has wells in it. You've seen pictures where they're pipetting fluids into these little things. So let's say, for example, I take a patient's blood or some fluid from that patient and I have it in these wells. And let's say, um, they have the organism that has, uh, I don't know, this, protein Q, the surface antigen. Well, um, what I can do now is I can have little antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, anti-Q antibodies that have on them what, what's called a fluorescent molecule. There's one called FITC, F-I-T-C. And if this antibody binds to uh, an antigen in one of the wells, then this particular uh, molecule will fluoresce when it's under UV light. So what I can do is I can put this antibody, say anti-Q antibody, into one well with its fluorescent or fluorochrome. The molecule is called a fluorochrome, something that fluoresces. I can take another antibody against, I don't know, protein Z and put it in another well and I can take a different monoclonal antibody against, I don't know, against uh, antigen X and put it in this well. And if this is the one that fluoresces, then I know that whatever is in this person's blood has to have that specific antigen on its surface. And because the antigen that we can develop the antibody against is unique to certain organisms, then I can pretty much say, well, if this one fluoresces, then I know that this must be the organism causing this person's illness. And we call those fluorescent assays. So it allows us to identify specific pathogens or toxins that are present in a person's blood by linking them to a monoclonal antibody. And there's something that works very similarly, although it's slightly different, and this is a term that people really like because it uses a, a name, the ELISA or ELISA assay. It stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Immunosorbent simply means the immune cells will absorb or be bound to this thing and they have an enzyme linked to them. And it works similarly to the last concept. I have a little well or a bunch of wells and a little plastic plate and I can pipe it into these wells different fluids. But in this case, I know that the wells are covered with different enzymes I'm sorry, not different enzymes, different antibodies, monoclonal antibodies against very specific um, antigens. 
sorry, I was drawing a blank. Um, so let's say I have some antibodies, some monoclonal antibodies against that are anti-Q in this well, some that are anti-Z protein, whatever that might be, and some that are anti, um, I don't know, X that are coding this well. And I mean, there's tons of these in there. I only put one or two in each one. Now, I take a drop of some fluid from somebody that has some pathogen or toxin in it, and I put it in each one of these wells. Well, the only well that this thing will stick to is the well that has the antibodies that match the antigen. So let's say this person has an organism that has protein Z in its membrane then what I'm going to get is a whole bunch of that organism bound here with all those little Z's in its membrane. Then I add a different monoclonal antibody. Or I can add really essentially the same monoclonal antibody, but now it has a little enzyme linked to it. Here, let me, sorry. And this enzyme when mixed with a certain color indicator will cause a chemical reaction that will give us a different color. Usually they turn yellow. So if I put this um, antibody in this well and I get a color change, then I know this organism must be the one causing this, page, this person's um, illness. So it's very similar to a fluorescent assay in the sense that it uses a monoclonal antibody put in a well but in one instance, the, uh, use, one of them uses a fluorochrome, a molecule that will fluoresce when we put it under UV light, and only the wells that have the monoclonal antibody bound with that fluorochrome will fluoresce, and then you can say, okay, well, if it's this well, it must be that pathogen. Where the enzyme-linked assay, you have to add uh, the pathogen or the uh, antigen, then you add a second version of the antibodies that are that have an enzyme linked to them and that enzyme will cause a chemical reaction in the fluids if the antibody binds so whichever one gives you the color change you know that that must be the pathogen they call them enzyme linked immunosorbent assays they all take advantage of our knowledge of monoclonal antibodies and the specific immune system these antibodies have to be produced and then isolated from some organism, okay? Now, there's a few others we could talk about. There's a bunch of others, but we're just gonna focus on those three. So one good thing that we can take away from our knowledge of the immune system is that it will allow us to develop monoclonal antibodies for rapid testing to determine if someone has a specific pathogen. You can even have monoclonal antibodies against human proteins. When someone has a heart attack, there are certain enzymes that are produced only when a person is having a heart attack. Or, and there are, they can be produced in other conditions, but linked with all the symptoms of a heart attack, if these proteins are present, then you know someone's probably having a heart attack. And there's an ELISA assay where they look for some proteins in our blood called creatine phosphokinase or CPK, SGOT, serum glutamate O-methyltransferase, and troponin. So if you work in an emergency room and they're doing troponin tests, they're looking for the troponin proteins from heart muscle cells, and there's an ELISA test against troponin, and you can tell if that person's had a heart attack. So we can use monoclonal antibodies and our knowledge of the immune system to develop, to develop all these rapid tests. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, one that's on a lot of people's minds these days, especially due to COVID, which is why I'm shooting all these videos, and that vaccines. Vaccines are also called immunizations, okay? So anytime you hear someone has been immunized, that means they've been vaccinated. To be vaccinated is to be immunized. A vaccine is an immunization. And essentially we are artificially stimulating someone's immune system the specific immune system to develop antibodies against an antigen that's either on the surface of a foreign invader, like one that's a protein in the capsid of a, of a virus, or in the membrane of, say, a specific bacterium or fungus or um, protozoan, parasite of some sort. 
so that if a person artificially stimu is stimulated to produce tons of those antibodies, then when they are exposed to the real thing, they don't get sick. So if you go to a foreign country, you have to take all these immunizations against all sorts of organisms that can cause amoebic dysentery and other things, lots of parasites and fungi. Um, or uh, we take advantage of it to prevent viral infections like the human papilloma virus, which can cause cervical cancer and genital warts. Now you can get the, um, the HPV vaccine, the human papilloma, papilloma virus vaccine um, you can get the flu vaccine, you can get the COVID vaccine, you can get vaccines against any number of things. So vaccines are, de are the result of our understanding of the immune system. And essentially what happens is something similar to what I explained before. So you take a person. I'm just gonna make a cheesy drawing here to be rapid, okay? Kind of a mutant, but nonetheless. Okay. So, um, you take some pathogen. That pathogen is going to have all sorts of proteins on its surface. And those proteins are called antigens or surface antigens. You can take the organism and you could expose the person to it, but they might get really, really, really sick. So what you can do is a number of things. When it comes to vaccines, they simply are artificial exposures to a part of the organism. So different vaccines work differently. So one of them is called an attenuated vaccine and very often called an attenuated virus vaccine. And um, sometimes they're called live attenuated virus vaccines. We're gonna give you what was the living organism, but it's been attenuated or moderated. And so one of the things we can do is we can, um, we somehow damage the pathogen to prevent the illness. For example, if I have a virus, like the coronavirus, I can have all these proteins on its surface, on its capsid, but I can actually treat the virus to where I can kill the genome. You can use enzymes called RNases or DNases, and they will destroy the DNA or the RNA in the organism. So I'm giving you what would really be a live virus, but it's been attenuated or treated in a way that it's not gonna make you sick. Another way is to damage what we call the spike proteins so it doesn't bind to your cells and cause you to get ill. Now, if I take that organism and I inject it into someone's body with a, an injection, then our immune cells will make antibodies against one or more of the surface antigens. Let's say it's against the little triangle protein. So now, this person is gonna have a humoral mediated response, a humoral mediated response. So they're now gonna have these antibodies all over their body flowing through their fluids so that when the real thing comes in with its DNA, and these surface antigens, when we take it into our body and are exposed, our immune system will neutralize it before you get sick. And so that's all that a vaccine is. And it can, remember, it comes from vodka, from cow, from cowpox. Remember the first guy, um, Jenner, to develop these, saw the ladies who were milkmaids had cowpox virus, caused little pustules, but it was otherwise pretty harmless. And those people didn't die from smallpox. And so he started inoculating people or vaccinating people with the cowpox, um, with pus from the cowpox pustules. And those people developed antibodies. And those antibodies actually not only were on the surface of, say, the cowpox, they were also on the surface of the virus that caused smallpox. And so their immune system recognized that specific pathogen. He just kind of got lucky. But 
So that's what a live attenuated vaccine is and where we do some kind of damage to the pathogen to prevent the illness. Uh, we can attenuate the virus or attenuate something so that it doesn't make you sick. Um, you can actually have what's called an inactivated virus, which is kind of the same thing in the sense that we treat the virus to make it less active. It won't replicate within your cells. And then when we expose you to it, you develop antibodies against it. So a live attenuated vaccine is where we actually purposely um, damage the pathogen so that it cannot cause an illness. And an activated virus is one in which we can prevent the virus from causing illness all in other ways. Um, and they're almost the same thing. They're not quite identical. Um, um, I guess one of the ways that we can say that's different between the inactivated virus is in an inactivated virus vaccine, one of the things we can do is we can treat the virus with a chemical called formalin. And basically, formalin will disrupt some of the um, proteins on the surface of the virus. And basically, we say that it is a killed virus. The virus can't cause any infection. And one of the things that's good about live attenuated vaccines is, um, one of the bad things is, it may cause some of the symptoms of the illness. So if you get a certain vaccine, say against the flu, for a day or two, you might feel some flu-like symptoms. You don't feel very good, but that's your immune system also developing the antibodies against it so that when the real thing tries to invade your body, it wipes it out. In an inactivated virus, what we do is we treat the virus with formalin and kill it. In a sense, it cannot replicate or cause the illness. Now, one of the benefits of an inactivated virus or a killed virus is um, they don't usually cause any symptoms where the um, live attenuated virus may cause some fever and chills and some of the symptoms that you would get if you were really sick from the real thing. Now, the live attenuated virus tends to have a much stronger and longer lasting effect than the heat killed virus, the disadvantage of the, uh, or the formalin killed virus and the um, inactivated viruses they tend not to have as strong of a response and very often they require you to have a booster shot, uh, a booster or two, because the first response isn't super strong. When you get another exposure to the exact same thing, your immune system ramps up to a second level and, and provides a much stronger response. Um, another type of vaccination, I'm gonna erase these two. So in one system, um, well, I'm not gonna go back into that. Um, there's things that we call a subunit virus, I'm um, vaccine, virus, vaccine. Okay. And these use what we call an epitope. Epi means above and tope means shape or topography. So they use an epitope, which is simply a piece of an antigen okay these are good for like exotoxins like snake venom and stuff um, and they can also work for other pathogens so suffice it to say and we've talked about this before when a protein is formed that protein is a long chain of amino acids and let's say there's an area on this protein where there's a specific group of amino acids that our immune system would recognize. Well, when this protein goes and folds up into its natured form, some of these amino acids, like let's say these two, might like to bind together. And so the protein will fold up, forming a chemical bond here, which might cause two other amino acids to stick together and over time, this protein will fold up into a three-dimensional shape. But what might happen is there's a specific group of amino acids. These three amino or four amino acids might be exposed on one part. Then our immune system might develop a variable region that's gonna bind to just those four amino acids. So we call that part of the molecule the epitope. 
the epitope is just the region on an antigen, the specific group of amino acids on an antigen that the antibody will bind to. So now, what if I could take just part of this thing, since this protein might make us sick if it were like an exotoxin, what if I gave you just a part of the amino acid sequence and so that I only get part of the molecule that has the little epitope associated with it? So that when the real thing is injected into the body, it's still going to recognize a sequence of amino acids on that protein. And if that protein is on the surface of something, and that something has the epitope sticking out, then my antibodies would recognize it and bind it up. And it could be a snake venom, it could be some kind of venom from some organism, like if you eat certain snails and they have a toxin on them, or it could be a protein on the surface of a pathogen. But we're only recognizing a subunit, a piece of the antigen, not the entire protein. It only recognizes the epitope or the subunit. So we call those subunit vaccines or epitope vaccines in which they recognize only a part of the antigenic protein. Um, and you don't get sick from it, but you still get the immunity, okay? So those are several different types of vaccines. A live attenuated virus, which can cause symptoms, but provides a real strong immune response. We can have a, um, an, a, an attenuated virus, we can have a killed virus um, in which the virus has been inactivated or killed by formalin and cannot reproduce, but can still cause an immune response. And then we can have what are called subunit or epitope vaccines. Now, um, there are other types of vaccines we can refer to. Uh, our knowledge of how DNA works, we can have what are called DNA vaccines. And in this situation, you inject a gene, essentially, a piece of DNA, that codes for the antigen of interest. So let's say we can go in an organism's chromosomes and we can find the series of bases that codes for the antigen that would be on the surface of the cell. Well, what if I could just inject the piece of DNA that codes for that protein? And as the DNA is incorporated into our cells, it will undergo protein synthesis, transcription, the rewriting of DNA and mRNA, and then translation by our own ribosomes. And so in our own cells, the ribosomes will start putting out this particular antigen. And if that antigen is expressed in the surface of the cells, our immune response can recognize them. And usually what happens is the antigen is released and we develop antibodies against it so that when the real organism enters our body with this antigen on its surface, it also gets eliminated or, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Not nullified, but uh, anyway, it becomes ineffective. Now, that's called a DNA vaccine. The next step, which is what they're using a lot for the COVID vaccine, is an RNA vaccine, and really it's messenger RNA, okay? So in an RNA vaccine, you simply inject the mRNA for the antigen. And it does the same thing as a DNA virus in the sense that our cells are gonna synthesize the protein, the antigen of interest, but we can skip the transcription step we don't have to rewrite the DNA and the, the mRNA. We simply have figured out the sequence of bases in the messenger RNA. I inject the mRNA into a human being. Their cells will make the protein of interest, the antigen, 
And then our immune cells will recognize that foreign antigen in our body, make antibodies against it. And so those are called RNA vaccines. Now, the good thing about these vaccines is the DNA and the RNA aren't super stable for a long time, so they can be broken down. Um, but we've started to perfect their, their, um, their usage. So what I want you guys to walk away knowing is this. There are practical applications uh, of our understanding of our immune system, specifically the specific immune response, in which we can use that to develop technology in order to A, use rapid tests to, to recognize specific pathogens or the presence of a specific antigen, um, and B, to help develop vaccines to alert our immune system so that they already produce memory cells and antibodies so that if the foreign invader does try to enter the body, we wipe it out before it causes an infection, okay? So that's really all I want you to know about the practical applications. There are far more that we can do and, and or discuss, but they're beyond the scope of this class. So um, I hope you learned something. I hope this made some sense. I really don't think these are the best videos. I really need to go back and reshoot them because I'm kind of editing in my head as I'm presenting you the information and trying to filter out stuff and decide what do I want to include. Um, but nonetheless, I do hope you find them helpful. Um, I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.